Let me welcome you again to Calvary Baptist Church in Brampton. In the name of our only King and Head, the Lord Jesus, our faithful Savior. My name is John Bodner, and I serve as an itinerant minister of the gospel attached to this local church. Our pastor, Pastor Ralph Willen, is presently very ill and under medical care. It is my privilege to support and assist him by filling the pulpit in his absence. The Willen family is keeping everyone posted on uh, the church's Facebook page, so we urge you to keep abreast of his condition, and we earnestly ask you to join us in prayer for him and for the family. Once more, I wish to invite you to hear my Savior through his inspired, infallible, and errant word, the Bible. And I'm going to ask you to hear me once more as I read to you the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. There went great multitudes with Jesus, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold and begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but was not able to finish. Or else, what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him which cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, once more we have opened the book of the Lord at this passage. And again, I ask you to stand among the throngs of people who crowd around Christ Jesus on the roads during his final journey to Jerusalem and to the cross. He is sifting out these great multitudes who are coming with him as mere adherents in search of those who are coming after him as committed cross-bearing disciples. No man ever spoke as my master spoke on earth. He taught the way of God in truth and accepted no man's person. He taught with authority and not as the scribes. His word was with power. And he often spoke in parables. That is one reason the common people heard him gladly. Speaking by parables, Christ Jesus could conceal his teaching from the heedless and reveal it to the humble. That is why his last word to us in this incident is, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Last time, he called us to listen. Listen as he laid down three stark terms of service without which we cannot be his disciples. This time, he's calling us to look. Look at three vivid picture parables to make us count the cost of being his disciples. Count the cost, says the Savior. He takes us to a drafting table to count the cost of construction. He takes us to a council table to count the cost of conflict. And he takes us to a kitchen table to count the cost of character. First, at the drafting table, the Lord Jesus says we must count the cost of construction. 
He wants to alert us to realize that following him is no trivial offhand undertaking. It demands as much serious consideration and deliberate resolve as any important aim in life. Many of the Savior's hearers were farmers or farm workers. So he starts with a, a major project common to most farms. Which of you, he says, intending to build a tower, counteth the cost? Towers stood over the fields, vineyards, and pastures of many a farm as an important outbuilding. They kept watch against pillagers and predators. They would store tools and produce. They would shelter workers against the elements. A tower was a significant asset, but to build it was a significant cost. So no wonder the Lord Jesus puts to them this common sense question. Which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he be have sufficient to finish it? The very first order of business in such a project is to sit down. Sit down and think. Sit down, think the entire task through, and count the money. You need cash to finish a job before you start, not after. Nobody can do this kind of work by luck. Nobody can uh, succeed by guesswork. Failure to plan is plan to fail. It means failure to finish, failure that will not only make you a loser, but a laughing stock to all around you. So the Savior warns us bluntly, lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Every real disciple of Christ must count the cost of construction because we need to budget our lives upon and build our lives upon him. In Luke 6, the Savior quotes it this way in a little parable. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood came and the, the stream beat vehemently upon that home, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Now it takes time to build a life for Christ. It takes commitment to confess him in baptism, to continue in his word as a church member, to attend public worship, Listen carefully to preaching. Participate in the Lord's table. It takes discipline to read the Bible and pray daily. It takes self-denial to put others ahead of yourself in obedience to the Savior's commands. It takes commitment to set aside the Lord's Day from work and recreation for rest and worship. You have to count the cost. It's well worth it. But if you don't, you will only find failure, loss, shame, and ridicule. Next, let us adjourn to the council table and count the cost of conflict. The opening of, at the opening of our era was an age in the Middle East when kings uh, gave their reigns either to lavish buildings or to reckless warfare. So these little vignettes of the Savior are pointedly relevant to his own day. Bible history is littered with assorted gaffes and disasters that visited the vanity and pride of kings who were rash and found defeat. If a typical case of that is in the life and death of King Amaziah of Judah, you'll find it in 2 Kings 14, verses 1 to 20. And the Savior sketches a similar scene for us here. He says, What king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth, whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? A would-be aggressor now finds himself under attack. His advanced intelligence reports leave him outnumbered two to one, thrown onto the defense of what can the man do? 
Once more, common sense demands that this king sit down and consult. Sit down. Sit down and think hard. Think and map out strategy end to end and count the manpower. If he is not ready and willing to draw a line, take a stand, and hold out at all costs, the disgrace of surrender is the only alternative to the catastrophe of defeat. Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. Every real disciple of Christ has to count the cost of conflict because we must brace for battle in the cause of Christ. There can be no peace talks. There can be no coexistence in this conflict. There is no discharge from this warfare. The watchword of the Christian is always no surrender. We are called to fight the good fight of faith, to lay hold of eternal life. We must endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Please make no mistake, brothers and sisters, we live under attack. From above, by the prince of the power of the air, from around, by the world, and from within, by the sinful flesh. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The Apostle James says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. And the Apostle Peter says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. The Christian cannot evade or avoid conflict. We need to go awake, alert, and fully armed by counting the cost of that conflict. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Count the cost of construction. Count the cost of conflict. Last, we turn to a kitchen table, and we count the cost of character. Christ Jesus has appealed to us to account the cost of being his disciples in his first pair of parables. In this third parable, he warns us of the consequences if we don't. So as he closes, he points to a simple kitchen commodity whose worth and use entirely depends upon its purity, its simplicity, its integrity. Salt. Salt. Verse 34, salt is good, says the Lord. To the ancient world, almost nothing was better than salt. In the Old Testament law, the Levitical ritual required every sacrifice brought to the altar be salted in token that it was pure and sincere. The fighting men of ancient armies were paid in salt, and it's from salt comes the term soldier. To this very day, we speak of an effective worker as a man who is worth his salt. Salt was essential to flavor, to preserve, to disinfect. And that is why Christ Jesus says of his people, ye are the salt of the earth. That is why Paul writes, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. But the salt of the first century was very different from the salt of the 21st century. Our salt is mined and refined in the purest possible form. We get pure crystals of, of sodium chloride in our bags of salt. 
Nothing had mixed at all. Now in ancient times, in Palestine, salt was boiled down from the Dead Sea. The waters, the heavy water of the Dead Sea were boiled down and the silt that came out was largely salty, so it was all ground up and used as salt. But that salt was largely mixed with gypsum and it very easily leached out when exposed to the air or to rain. Everyone knew by experience what the Savior talked about when he said these words. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. Without that vital inner grace which brings wholehearted devotion and self-sacrifice to our service, Without the heart behind the deed, without the walk behind the talk, there is only sham and shame. There is only hollow hypocrisy. Nothing so harms pure religion and undefiled as the apostasy of a Demas or of a Judas. Men cast it out. I want to say this very plainly because so many of us are exposed by a, to a wide range of media ministries. We are all too captivated. We are rather bamboozled by the razzle-dazzle of personalities and talent. It impresses many. But the Son of God is not deceived. Gifts mean nothing. I say it again. Gifts mean nothing. Grace means everything. Judas had gifts. He had the whole panoply of apostolic powers to work miracles and to speak and to heal. Demas had gifts. He stood on equal footing with Timothy among the apostolic messengers. Judas had gifts, Demas had gifts, but neither had grace. And this is what the Lord Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. As I close, I must invite you to turn from your sin and self, to trust yourself to my Savior. Come to him. And let me summon you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow my Savior. Come after him. You will then be saved. You will then have a life of satisfaction and joy. But you must count the cost. The cost of construction, the cost of conflict, the cost of character. Count the cost.